Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Ethington, and I get to follow Jesus as the pastor for Trinity Evangelical Free Church. And so thank you for joining us this morning in our uh, online uh, gathering. So today is the day on the Christian calendar that is often referred to as Palm Sunday. Uh, this celebrates the day that uh, Jesus entered Jerusalem to participate in the annual Passover feast, which commemorated God's great deliverance of his people from slavery in Egypt. So as Jesus came into Jerusalem, the people had high hopes that Jesus would deliver them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. Well, thousands of people welcomed Jesus with open arms and they waved palm branches. In fact, Matthew frames his description of this scene with these words from the prophet Zechariah. Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. Humble. Well, less than a week later, the people called for Jesus' crucifixion. They were not looking for a humble king. What are you looking for? If you're a child, or remember when you were, you probably could think of someone that you looked up to, maybe you wanted to be like that person. Well, when I was a little guy, uh, I, I did not aspire to be humble. Uh, but I aspired to throw a football like Joe Montana or a baseball like Raleigh Fingers. So I think all of us have people in our lives who have some athletic qualities or some abilities or something that we look up to as examples and we want to be like them in those areas. But what about humility? Well, Philippians chapter 2 paints a beautiful picture of Jesus' humility when he took on human flesh and died on a cross. Well, this uh, part of Philippians chapter 2 is placed in a broader section that has to do with living as citizens of heaven while being residents of this broken world. So chapter 2 begins by reminding the Philippian believers of their spiritual blessings in Christ. Since there really is encouragement in Christ, since there is comfort from love, since there is participation in the Spirit, since there is affection and sympathy, the people of God are able to be of the same mind and have the same love and be in a full accord and of one mind. So those four realities are God's gifts that come to, uh, or I should say, come along with new life in Christ and that bring along those four results in the local church. So God's gift to us in Christ bring the unity required to be God's church on purpose. That's what we saw last week. And only a church that is purposely centered on Jesus Christ and his gospel can offer something truly helpful to a world in search of true and lasting hope, whether it's a time of pandemic or any other time. So this is followed then in Philippians chapter 2 by this practical exhortation to eliminate selfish ambition and conceit by cultivating humility. Well, it's not natural for any of us to be humble. Never try to be humble. Think about that. You can't just become humble by thinking about being humble. In fact, that thinking is centered on yourself, which is the opposite direction of becoming humble. Well, Philippians shows us that we can only become truly humble when we look to Jesus. Then, when we are humble in our interactions with others, we display the glory of God. Well, Philippians displays the glory of God by presenting Jesus as the ultimate example of humility. But there's more. And so Jesus' example of humility is not just indicative, it's effective. That is to say that his, his perfect life and his death and his resurrection do not just indicate what a perfect example of humility would look like, Jesus' perfect death and his life and resurrection have the real effect of giving us new life through faith. Well, it's true that Hall of Fame quarterback Joe Montana throwing a perfect pass to Jerry Rice indicated a good example, but never effectively accomplished anything inside of me as a kid, certainly not in my skinny little arms. However, Jesus' perfect life and death and resurrection have the supernatural effect of giving us new life through faith. 
So again, Jesus only came to indicate what a perfect example of humility looks like. Well, then we might have this idea that, that as long as we try our best and be pretty good, then that's enough to restore the brokenness in our relationship with God that is caused by our sin. Well, the Bible says that no one can ever work hard enough to restore a broken relationship with God. Again, fortunately, Jesus' example is not just indicative, it's also effective for all who believe. So Jesus' perfect life and death and resurrection, this great display of humility, count as ours if you believe. So when you trust Jesus, your perfect, his perfect record of righteousness is yours. His, his death, his death penalty that he paid, that he didn't sin, but he paid it for you, it becomes yours. And his triumphant resurrection becomes yours too. So then you have new life in him now and forever. That's how it works. It's, it's not just an example. It's effective by faith. So please open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I hope to show you that this morning's verses point to this great reality that we can glorify God by following Jesus' example of humility in how we relate to others. Well, those who are in Christ ought to live like Christ. So please pray with me as we seek to learn from God's word together. Oh God, would you speak? Would you use your word empowered by your spirit to speak life into us, that we would see you as you are, and God, your word would supernaturally effect, have this effect in us, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So God, please have your way in me as I preach. Be glorified here in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So this is the very word of God. And as I suggested last week, if Philippians was a car, these verses, I think, would be the engine. So it might be possible for a person to just hear, you know, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Eh, yeah, I, I can do that. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Yeah, check. I, I, I can do that. But then verse 5 begins to shake that attitude to its foundation. Have this mind among yourselves. Well, the phrase, which is yours in Christ Jesus, can also be translated, which was also in Christ Jesus. So I won't take time to get into it now, but I think this might actually be a better uh, translation because it more effectively sets the stage for this main idea in the context of verses 6 through 8 that is, that is about how Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. That's the, the, you know, Paul is addressing disunity in the church that is coming out of the Philippians' pride and selfishness. So he points them to Christ. So to have the mind of Christ is to have the same attitude that Jesus demonstrated. So, beloved of God, we can glorify God by following Jesus' example of humility in how we relate to others. But again, I say, have you ever tried to be humble? Trying to be humble puts the focus on ourselves, which is the opposite of humility. Well, then if we're supposed to be humble, what's our hope? Well, think about this. If you look at your Bible, if Paul just skipped verses 5 through 11, 
Well, he, he could have not mentioned Jesus in his work at all. He, he could have just um, uh, skipped that over and said, you know what, just, just be more humble, be more humble. Well, Paul doesn't do that, nor does he give them a little pamphlet about, you know, seven steps towards how to be humble. But what he does is he points them toward Jesus and what Jesus accomplished in their place. So focusing on Jesus and on Jesus' work, that is the gospel, goes a long way in moving us toward counting others more significant than ourselves and looking to the interests of others. Well, verses 6 through 11, I understand, are likely a hymn that was already in circulation among the early churches. So it was probably a favorite of Paul's and could well be the hymn that he was singing in prison in Philippi, as recorded in Acts chapter 16. So verses 6 through 11, this hymn here, underscore the humility of Jesus by focusing on his identification with mankind, his crucifixion on the cross, his exaltation, and the proclamation of his glory. These, these things are listed in your uh, worship guide, which can be found online as well. So first is identification. Well, maybe you've heard the word incarnation. Incarnation is from the Latin word, which um, means meat or flesh. So God, the eternal son, incarnated. That is, he took on flesh, and that's what we celebrate at Christmas. Well, if you're following along on the outline in the worship guide, you see that I use the word identification rather than the word incarnation here. Well, I did this because the, the main idea here is not just that God put himself in a, in a body, but that he walked among and ate and breathed and identified with mankind, with real human beings. So Jesus is God, the eternal son, who added full humanity to his eternal deity, yet was without sin. <laughs> How glorious. So imagine this. The gospel of Jesus, according to John, begins this way. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, this then prefaces 21 chapters of evidence that Jesus claimed to be God, the eternal son, is indeed true. Well, Hebrews chapter 1 says that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Colossians chapter 2 says that in Jesus, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. So the scriptures say that Jesus remained fully God as he took on human flesh. So this phrase, uh, form of God, here in verse 6, is understood as embodying the glory of God. So both the Old and New Testament speak of the glory of God as the manifestation of God himself. So, so Jesus has both a human nature and a divine nature now and forever. And the characteristics of each nature are entirely preserved. The, the one does not cancel out or compromise the other. So a couple of illustrations would be helpful here, imperfect as they may be. So when you mix red paint and yellow paint, you get a whole new color, you get orange. That's not what happened. That's not what happened when God, the eternal son, took on human flesh. If Jesus was a paint color, he would somehow still be fully red and fully yellow. So we can't say it like that. So Jesus is not also, or is also not like uh, a can of paint that is only half red and half yellow. Jesus is fully God and fully man. Well, he is also not like uh, a red paint that appears to be yellow or orange for a while, but really isn't. Well, Jesus did not just seem to appear to be human. The Gospel of Jesus, according to Luke, gives an account of um, people speaking well of Jesus and marveling at his gracious words. They said, is not this Joseph's son? Well, clearly these people recognize him as a real human person. So then, moving on in the text here, to say that Jesus did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, is to say that he did not cling to it, to use it to his advantage. He didn't, he didn't forcibly retain his rights and privileges as God the Eternal Son. We'll see later that he, he obediently went and did this. Well, this word grasped at the end of verse 6 can be translated clung to or forcibly retained. See, the idea here is that Jesus willingly set aside his rights and his privileges of his divine nature as he took on this human nature and walked among his fallen creation. So then he emptied himself by temporarily setting aside his garments of splendor, his eternal garments of splendor, and took on garments of humanity. 
So about a decade ago, I was intrigued by this TV show called Undercover Boss. I watched a few episodes. The first episode had the president of this large garbage disposal company setting aside his expensive Italian-made three-piece business suit, I think. And he put on coveralls and one of those yellow reflector vests. And he worked in the garbage dump alongside the entry-level employees, the recycling and, and garbage dump and so on. So this company president then, he would walk among them and interact with them as one of them. Then toward the end of the show, the company president revealed himself as this big shot executive. And they're all astounded. Like, that was him? Really? Well, obviously this, this uh, is not a perfect illustration, but they came to me as I was thinking about giving this glimpse of the humility of Jesus walking among his creation. He set all aside all the riches and glory that he would take on flesh to walk among us. Or what about you? Picture yourself, you're, in a, you're waiting in a long line. Of course, you're six feet apart because you have to have social distancing. You're at a customer service counter. You're waiting in a long line. It's finally your turn. But then on the corner of your eye, you see the person who's last in line and they're really in need and they're desperate. And you trade places with them. Well, what, what would it take to trade places with, with that person? You've earned it. You belong here. This is yours. You're right. You're next in line. You know what it would take? Humility. It, it would take counting someone as more significant than yourself. So the idea here is that Jesus, God the eternal son, took on human flesh and identified with human beings, even including the temptations that we face. The temptation to not do that. To not go to the back of the line. So when we are tempted to forcibly retain or cling to our rights and privileges over others, we can glorify God by following this example and choosing to humbly relate to others. And as Trinity, as God's church on purpose, we, our humble service, our, our love and service demonstrates this unity that we have in Christ, this unity we have with Christ and points our community toward hope in Jesus. So let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing it. So then Jesus took the form of the servant, the, the text says. The, the word servant in verse 7 can also be translated as slave. So please don't picture a man in a tuxedo at a fancy party who is handing out expensive desserts and appetizers, the names of which you cannot pronounce. That's not what we're talking about here. In the ancient Roman Empire, where the Philippian church belonged, the, the humiliation of slavery or servanthood was not in terms of the loss of freedom, but, but it was in the shame of being a slave. The humility, the humiliation of being a slave. Well, the Bible speaks of all of mankind being enslaved, but in a much greater way, to sin. And here is Jesus, God the Eternal Son, humbly taking on human flesh to identify with us that he could pay the penalty for that sin. How glorious. How glorious. So in addition to Jesus displaying his humility through identification with his image bearers, that's you and me, he displayed humility in his crucifixion. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus didn't take on flesh just to set an example in life, but to pay the penalty for sin in his death in place of all who believe. Certainly Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. He's God. He's the author of life. But why death? Why death? Couldn't Jesus just set an example for us in his perfect life? Well, here we need to remember that Jesus' example for us is not just indicative, it's effective. Jesus' life and death and resurrection do not just indicate the ultimate example of humility. I could watch game after game of Joe Montana throwing a perfect spiral to Jerry Rice, but it would not affect real change inside of me. In fact, Mon Montana's touchdown passes will never count as if they were mine. They'll never count as mine. So Jesus did this in our place. It's not just indicative of an you know, example of humility. It's effective in us supernaturally. So again, I say, if Jesus just came to set a good example for us, we could have this misunderstanding that as long as we're pretty good people and do our best, well, then that's enough to restore this broken relationship with God caused by sin. 
But Jesus' example is not just indicative, it is effective by faith. So when you trust Jesus Christ, his record becomes yours. His life, his death, his resurrection becomes yours. That's how it works. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, As we behold the glory of the Lord, we are transformed to be like him. Well, if all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily in Jesus Christ, he is the glory of the Lord. How, how do we behold him? That we would be transformed to be like him. My opportunity to say the same thing I say every week by being in the Word. It's the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, that does the work of God in the people of God for the glory of God. And so we read the Scriptures. So Jesus' example then isn't just some far-off thing that it indicates how to be humble, but it affects us. It has this effect on us from the inside out. So we're transformed to be like him. So seeing Jesus as he is does something in us. Well, it's true that sin is infinitely more deadly than this coronavirus. It has infected every single descendant of God's first two image bearers, those first two human beings. Well, the disastrous consequence of sin is a broken relationship with God. Genesis chapter 3 shows us that this cannot be fixed by sewing a bunch of fig leaves together. No human effort can repair the broken relationship between God and man caused by man's sin. Thinking about this coronavirus, it would, it would be little help to you or to me if a doctor found a treatment for this virus and, and said, okay, I'm going to heal myself. Oh, I did it. Look, oh, okay, so well, now you know it's possible. It can be done. So you go ahead and invent your own treatment. <laughs> that wouldn't help us at all, really. But what if that doctor said, you know, I, I'm going to take on the full effects of this coronavirus so that you will never have to. I'll take on all the symptoms. I'll suffer. And then I'll die of this coronavirus in your place. All that you have to do is believe that I've done it for you. And of course, you'll deal with some symptoms while you remain as a resident of this broken world. But you will be guarded from the death by this coronavirus forever. It's the great physician. <laughs> so how would you respond to that doctor? Well, the Old Testament book called Deuteronomy says that anyone killed on a cross is considered cursed by God. Crucifixion on a cross with a slow, brutally painful death. Jesus didn't go quickly by a lethal injection or even firing squad. The horror of the crucifixion, paints a picture of the horror of sin. This is death on a cross. And I love how John chapter 10 records this interaction that Jesus had with some religious leaders who would later crucify him. Jesus said, Hey, look, I, I lay down my life so that I may take it up again, and no one takes it from me. <laughs> but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. <laughs> uh, so Jesus willingly laid down his life on the cross for you. Well, certainly there are people who have set a good, humble example by living their lives, and in some cases even giving their lives, dying for someone else, but no one, no one has ever been able to take it up again <laughs> except Jesus the Lord. So the full identity of this man, who was truly in the form of God, was veiled in his crucifixion, but it was then revealed in his exaltation. So beloved of God, remember where you came from. Your new life through faith in Jesus Christ is completely a gift from God. It's completely a gift from God. It's a gift of his grace. So you and I can glorify God by following that example of humility in how we relate to others. He laid down his life for you and for me. Look in verse 9 then. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Well, the phrase highly exalted, I love this. It's literally hyper exalted. So it emphasizes this incomparable, absolute majesty of Christ as Lord. 
So that same word hyper exalted is found in the Greek translation of Psalm 97, which says, For you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above, that is, hyper exalted above all gods, small g there, the world's gods, the, the nation's idols. Well, what is this name that is above every name? Well, Isaiah chapter 42 records God saying to his people, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other. Well, the name Lord is above every name. I put a handful of references uh, from Isaiah in your worship guide this week. I encourage you to look them up. It, it uses the word Lord and speaks of that being his name. It's in the, the mid-40s of the um, book of Isaiah. So I encourage you to look those up and just delight in his lordship over you. Delight in that great and majestic name. Well, Ephesians chapter 1 says that Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. All things are under the feet of King Jesus. So calling Jesus Lord doesn't take away from the glory of God the Father. Calling Jesus Lord magnifies the glory of God the Father and his love and the great news of this gospel. He is Lord. Think about this authority as Lord over all. The last words of the resurrected Lord Jesus recorded by Matthew are these. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Well, all authority includes complete authority over every kind of virus and everything else. He is Lord of all. This is Jesus the Lord. So then Jesus' perfect display of humility through his identification with mankind and his crucifixion on the cross that led to his exaltation as Lord of all also leads to his proclamation as Lord of all. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, bowing your knee acknowledges that you are the subject of someone else's authority. Well, slaves bow before their masters to acknowledge their status and their willingness to obey their master. Well, the whole universe is under the ultimate authority of the resurrected Lord Jesus the Christ. So all angels and demons, all human beings, everything else in all creation, in heavens, in the earth, and under the earth, God spoke similar words to the prophet Isaiah when he said, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Well, the context of those verses in Isaiah is the promise that God will rescue his people. Well, a knee that refuses to bow down now will be forced to bow down later. God promises that Jesus' lordship will be proclaimed. So all of creation will eventually submit to his lordship, either willingly or unwillingly. Well, as is church on purpose, Trinity Church, we are glad, we, are, we count all joy to bow together humbly, under his lordship. So then as we do that, as we serve and submit to the Lord Jesus, our unity in Christ is on display as we follow Jesus' example of humility. So we proclaim that Jesus is Lord when we reach out to others during this virus pandemic, when we love and serve and give humil in humility. We proclaim that Jesus is Lord. We reach out to others. We serve others. We glorify God and point others toward hope in him by following his example as we humbly love and serve. Now, we don't know when this will all be over with. I can't wait for us to be together again. But the fact is, probably not everyone will be infected with this coronavirus. But everyone has already been affected by sin. There's only one hope for that infection. And his name is Lord Jesus. So our family, our friends, our neighbors, they'll only know this if we tell them and demonstrate it to them in our transformed lives. 
We know that the church elders are meeting weekly now to pray and discuss how to best equip and encourage the church family to uh, be a light for Christ during this coronavirus pandemic. So generally speaking, we want to build on the relationships that we already have, whether it be with our Awana families, whether it be through Lydia's Cupboard and the clients we serve there, or a few other uh, ways that we are engaged in the community. Um, a few other opportunities are coming to light here and there, and we'll keep, you, keep in touch with you by phone call and by email. Uh, one I want to highlight is Lydia's Cupboard is coming up on April 14th, so our guests are going to uh, drive through and receive a bag of household items. So if you're in the Ripon community and you're in need, please call our church office, 920-748-7100. We'll give you information on that, and we will be glad to serve you and support you and give to you uh, as Christ has given to us. It would be a privilege for us to support you and your household uh, by sharing what God has given us. And so, church family, I uh, would encourage you, if you have an opportunity to give toward Lydia's Cupboard. The, the need is increasing in our community day by day. There's also opportunities to give uh, through the food bank. You'll see something on Facebook if you're on Facebook. But I want to encourage you that I, I've seen such a generous church in Trinity. It's awesome what God is doing. So I remind you that any time you consider what God has given you as something not to be grasped, not to be forcibly retained, you glorify God by following Jesus' example of humility. When we see Jesus and we know him more, we, we delight in him more and more. We delight to bow our knee and confess with our mouth, proclaim that he is Lord. So in this proclamation, We're empowered by God's Spirit as he brings us together in unity as his church on purpose to reach Ripon and the surrounding communities with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you, beloved of God, as you read and as you pray, as you worship God on your own this week, be in the Word. Be in the Word. Remember that it's the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, that does the work of God in you. That is the people of God. And we know, of course, that is ultimately for the glory of God. Well, today is the first Sunday of the month. It's Communion Sunday, and there's a real sense of loss in me because right now, normally, I would get to lead us in sharing in the Lord's Supper and breaking the bread and sharing the cup and reminding each other that that empty cup, when we finish that celebration, reminds us that all of God's right wrath for our sin has been poured out on the cross, and it's empty now and forever. So I'll, I'll record a separate video with some encouragement about how to do communion, celebrate the Lord's Supper in your own household until we can be together again. Um, but until then, I just want to remind you that you are so, so deeply loved by this great God who humbly took on human flesh, that, that he would live perfect life and die a sacrificial death and rise again to have new life in place of all who believe. So let's glorify God by following Jesus' example of humility and humbly loving and serving others. I leave you with this word of blessing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go be at peace with this great God by faith.